And the main event is that I want to introduce Nancy Fishburne. Now, Nancy is a lifelong UX person with a big background in linguistics. And I first met her when uh, she and I worked at IBM uh, Research. And she's worked many other places. And uh, one of the things she's done is she's gotten involved with an organization that looks, looks into voting uh, in, in various ways um, from a UX point of view. So this is a um, uh, description of what she was planning to do this evening. Um, but I really think that it's more interesting for her to take over and um, let, let me sink away. And you, you can listen to her talk about this, um, about overcoming overvoting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ted. I'm gonna <clears throat> try sharing my screen and I think this should work. And now if I say slideshow, Okay, thanks everybody for showing up today. Um, and I if you can't see it, wave at me because I can see most of you. <clears throat> okay, so my question is, can graphic design, that is the insertion of certain kinds of features onto the ballot help prevent overvoting? But here's what we're gonna, the order of things that we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna tell you about, introduce myself and the organization I was working with. I'm going to explain to you about county election offices that conduct elections, which I think many of the people on this call know, but people who may be viewing this later might not be so well educated. I'm going to talk about the various different constraints on layout that we have because of a whole bunch of reasons. Then I'm going to talk about the wording and option, wording and layout options that these county officials were dealing with. Whoops, whoops, come back. One one back. Can you go that one? Are you talking? Oh, about sorry. Here we go. Um, this is the problem with Google. Whatever. Anyway, then we'll see what the results for that election were. And we'll talk a little bit about how to prevent overvoting in a general case. And then we can get into the discussion. And I know that I have at least two people who have served as poll workers besides myself on the call. Maybe the rest of you who are also poll workers will come out in good time. So um, some relevant things about me. I've lived in multiple states and regions of the U.S. I've lived in at least three, four states. I was too young when I lived in some of those other places. I have a PhD in linguistics, as Ted noted. Um, I took, I Gave a, I gave myself a soft landing out of academia and into industry. <laughs> and, uh, and I've worked with several nonprofits. And the one that's relevant here is the Center for Civic Design. I've been a Bayhai member since 1991, and I only moved back to California in 92. So that shows some dedication there. And I started registering voters at age seven, although I was not allowed to <laughs> sign them in. Finally, what I learned was that uh, at age seven, that not all adults know how to fill out forms and that forms can be confusing for people who are not doing that kind of thing all the time. And that was an eye opener for me. Um, I went with my dad. So when it came time to swear somebody in that says, you know, I promise I will be a good voter. Uh, he was the one who did that because he was over 21. Um, you can ask me about some of these other topics if you like, but let's go ahead. So um, the organization I mentioned, the Center for Civic Design, I believe is 10 years old this year, and they have as their goal assuring voter intent through design. And you may also have heard this motto, democracy is a design problem. And, and you may also have recognized this definition, design is the rendering of intent. So all these things together tell you a little bit about the attitude of the uh, organization and me going in to help them with some of the issues that they were dealing with. The work that I'm talking about here was sponsored by, funded by the Future of California Elections and conducted in collaboration with the League of Women Voters of Northern California. So here's the news. County election offices are the ones that conduct elections. 
there is, and the case study that we're going to take up today is the June 2016 primary for U.S. Senator in California. So th this is the map of the 58 counties of California. I am not going to give you a test on that, but just to note that uh, there are indeed 58 separate counties. And here's a different map of that same territory where it shows population density. So the most populous counties are, you know, San Francisco in terms of density, Orange County, Los Angeles County, and so on. Some of these big ones, the up through, I would say, where that section eight on the left, on the right hand side of your screen is, those are bigger by far than the remaining counties below them, except Riverside is big and it didn't get into, it's not so dense, Riverside County that is. Anyhow, I think you'll see by this that uh, why it is there's so many differences among the different counties. Each county uh, gets to lay out its own ballot. And that's because there are specific contests that are specific to the counties. All, is, all of this is governed throughout by the California election code, the laws governing elections in the state of California. So this challenge that we are gonna talk about today began with an open Senate seat. Senator Boxer said she would not uh, run again for Senate as a, and she would be finished as of January 17. So that meant uh, somebody else with the right qualifications needed to um, run for office. And indeed, many people stepped up to do that. So one of the interesting things is that the qualifications to run for Senate are you must be a U.S. citizen for a certain length of time, your age, and you're, uh, you must be a resident of the state when you're sworn in. But the filing fee is 2% of the first year's salary for that job or around $3,000, or 7,000 signatures of voters who would support your candidacy. That means it's a relatively low bar. I'm sure somebody who had to put $3,000 forward thinks it wasn't so low, but, but if in the big scheme of things, this meant that there was a huge number of people who stepped forward to run for office. And you may recall, if you're old enough or you read the history, that in 2003, we had an election to determine whether Gray Davis would be recalled as governor. And that was there were 100 candidates for the position of governor, and that's when Arnold Schwarzenegger won. However, notice that the difference between the 2003 situation and the 2016 situation is there was a single issue on the ballot for the recall of Gray Davis. We'd everybody knew you had to choose one out of all those things and out of all those candidates who were there. However, in the case of the primary of uh, 2016, there were a field, there was a field of, sorry, let me go back one second, field of 34 candidates plus a write-in spot that had to be displayed among all the other races and contests that were going on. So that made it different. Now, Ted already previewed for you that overvoting is election jargon for selection, selecting more than the allowed number for a particular contest. If it says for supervisor, you can vote for up to three. If you vote for four or more, that particular contest, you, your ballot is not validated. And the same is true in this instance where there was allowed a single vote among the 34 candidates or the write-in. And anybody who voted for more than one had their vote invalidated. Okay, what kind of constraints do we ha have on the layout of the ballot in the state of California? And I think this is probably similar to other states as well. First of all, there's the order of contests and the order of candidates. So it's not arbitrary what position things fall on on the ballot. In fact, you have to show things that are at the federal level first and president, if there is a president, presidential election, although there wasn't in uh, 16, uh, would have been first. And then I guess there was one in 16, but we'll talk about that. Okay. So president was first, senator was second. 
um, and congressional representative is third, then comes state senate, state uh, state assembly, and so on. <laughs> the layout depends on the tolerances of the kinds of tallying equipment that reads the marks. And so that means it depends on what your county, what the re relevant county has as equipment. And the, the, the election officials in each county know what that is. And so they know not to try to put a solid line where there's going to be a fold in the paper as they mail it out to you, because that may or may not be detected. The folds are important to separate from the lines and so on. Um, it also is the case that the law governs, I'm going down here, the law governs the wording for the instructions and includes notes about sizes of font, types of font, capitalization, and a whole bunch of things about the display of the wording on the ballot, uh, which we could critique, but we're not going to change in time for this 2016 election. The print requirements also depend on the kind of equipment that you're using to uh, read the thing. And it may dictate the layout of columns and the spacing between the names. So how, how many columns does your equipment allow and how many names can you fit onto a single sheet of paper? There is an extremely short time between certifying candidates and mailing to overseas voters. I'll show you that. And don't increase the number of pages, even if you think that would help it a lot because that increases the costs uh, both for mailing and printing. So it does uh, also require a little bit of design skill. However, who is doing this work? These are the county officials. And in those tiny counties like Alpine and Mono, there is one person or maybe two who serves the role as county clerk, county assessor, and registrar of voters. And that's true actually for many of the smaller counties. So here's one person and maybe their assistant. Uh, Yolo County is a good example where there are two people running that office. So I, I sort of previewed a lot of these things. Um, what you may not know is what's the order of names on the ballot. And that's determined by a random randomization of the alphabet so that in county number one, let's say it's Alpine, uh, probably Alameda is before Alpine, right? So in Alameda County, the order might be uh, start with the letter. It's not even just start with D and go down. It's rearrange the order of letters. And then the next county down will start with the second in random. That county I will start with the letter. So that throughout the counties, the hope is that you will see that there will be a different order of candidates in each county. However, a county like Los Angeles will have the same order all the way through. So it's a little bit disingenuous that it's perfectly randomized. Um, here's where I, an example of the law dictating the size, the style of font, and the wording. And so you can say, sorry. That was my my mouse moving. I was going to try to point, but I won't do that because it'll just mess things up. Uh, you can see not smaller than 30 point. You can see the words official ballot, which can be as small as 24 point and so on. All these things are part of the California Election Code. Now, uh, so that's the space, the equipment for the voting also dictates the spacing between contests on the page the spacing between candidate names and where the folds go and by implication areas to avoid printing crucial information. A printed ballot and the envelope also constrain the layout, partly because the postal regulations determine what kinds of information can appear on the same face of the ballot as the address appears. And election regulations determine what information can appear externally versus hidden on a panel of the envelope. So all these things are dictated. Now here's my schematic, very, very detailed, of the March 2016 calendar. So there was roughly, I'll say, eight to 10 days between the date when all the people who wanted to run were certified as yes, they did pay their money, they got enough signatures, whatever it is, and they've turned in all of their information. And then eight or 10 days later is the requirement this must be mailed to the overseas voters by that date in order for them to get them back to us 
by the election date in June. That's when it was in June. Um, so that's a very, very brief time. So they've got to have a pretty good idea of what they're going to uh, what they're going to have on the ballot and how they're going to arrange it just as the candidates get certified. And we already talked about extra pages, meaning extra postage because of weight, as well as, you know, other reasons. And here we had a natural experiment where 58 different officials are acting as designers. And each one is puzzling about how are we going to display 34 candidates' names in an unbiased way and communicate you can only vote for one of these. And this image is, uh, we were sitting in a room and talking about this with several people. And luckily for us, Allison knew her way around the election code and was finding the relevant citations for us. Now, this was not the first project undertaken by the uh, Center for Civic Design. And by this time they had already published, uh, I think most of the field guides, the first 10 field guides. And these are available to all. Uh, if you want printed copies of them, I can get you a few, but the, they're also available online and they are intended to be all accessible. The interesting thing, I can sh I'm not going to take them out and show them to you, but the, they are defined by certain topics. So designing usable ballots is one of them mentioned here. Uh, writing instructions that voters will understand. Testing ballots for usability is a separate one and effective poll worker materials. So you can get all of these. And uh, there are printable PDFs for the field guides, volume one through 10, okay? And I urge you to look at that and enjoy that and share that with any voting officials that you might like to share it with. Okay, so here's where people had options about layout and some wording. And mostly it was about columns, boundaries, and messaging, where and what to use for messaging. So here are just a few things. Uh, they Did they choose one column for the Senate race? Did they have to do two columns or more? And which face of the card? So I'm, I'm using election jargon here. The, a piece of paper is a card and it has a front and a back. Those are the two faces of the card, okay? So how many cards are you gonna have to display your whole election? And how many columns do you have? And as we said, it depends on which kind of equipment you're using, partly. How do you separate this particular contest from the others? Do you show the title of the contest? This I give you examples of all these things. So anyway, let me jump there to one of these uh, uh, graphical examples. So on the front, which is shown on the left side of your screen, you can see that first box on the top it shows some instructions. Oh, we're missing a two, all right. Uh, anyway, that's the instructions. And all that wording that's above that bold mark, the bold line across there, all that wording is dictated by the election code, okay? Sorry. Uh, contest order, the specific mandated language, and the instruction, for example, in this instance, this was uh, Santa Cruz County, uh, the instruction which says, turn the page over, continue voting on the other side. And you'll notice at the bottom, that's the same instruction that says, vote both sides. Now on the reverse of this, you'll see there are, con well, you can almost see there's a contest title uh, at the top, you know, US Senator, which didn't get the box correctly, and the words vote for one. And then we have all of these people's names and then we have uh, the number of other columns. In this case, this is a three column format where printing exists only in two of the columns, okay? I'm going to see if we can, there we go, whoa. Did we do that? Yes. Oh, the type of voting equipment, we said this. Now, prior research, there was prior research on a long election like this. It says putting all the names in one column in a, uh, for a single contest avoids some errors. Most optical scanning ballots use a three column format. So one of them uses three columns of equal width per face, and it can adapt to two columns, one narrow and one double width. And a different system uses two 
wider equally sized columns per face. And I'll show you examples of all those. I'm assuming we can do there. So here is San Joaquin County and San Joaquin and the American independent ballot. So there are four different parties which are recognized, were recognized in this particular election. <clears throat> On the front, we've got these two equal sized columns. And for president of the United States, uh, everybody noticed the, uh, the president in the one column and then all of the candidates for federal election for a senator, vote for one, are fitting in the second column with the right in case on the bottom. And then it says vote both sides because there are other elections on the back. So this is the US representative for district nine, the state senator, the assembly district 13, and the mayor of Stockton and uh, a measure supporting the suspension of legislation. Well, anyway, this proposition 50 was on the ballot. And that's all that was on the ballot in San Joaquin County in that case. But it gives you an example of the two column format. Now I'm gonna show you Mono County, a, a county with about 4,000 people, and yet they have to conduct a full election just like everybody else. And they chose not to put the, um, they have a three equal size column treatment here. And they chose not to put the Senate race on the front, but rather on the reverse side. So they could fit it all in because they didn't like how little room was left after the instructions. So president was on the front. And if you are on the second piece on the lower left there is if you ask for a nonpartisan ballot, which is also called no party preference, NPP, uh, then you immediately said you're registered as no party preference, continue voting on the second side, on the other side of this page. And that's where they fit all those names into a single column, yay. And then the rest of those measures. And not only did they have the state number 50, they had a local proposition G about schools. Now here's the summary for you. How many columns? 25 count column, sorry, English. 25 counties used a single column, like some of those we've already seen. This one on the left is Marin, and uh, next to it is Shasta. And 33 count counties used two or more columns. Okay, uh, you're seeing San Diego on the on the right hand side where it says sample, and then all the way over is Mendocino. And so San Diego fit it not only on this one side, but it says continued on the next page. And if you count the number of names there that are visible, it's only about 25, and this is 34 that we need to fit. So San Diego County divided it into actually three columns, two visible on one side and one on the reverse, whereas the nonpartisan ballot for Mendocino County shows three columns on a single side. And I think you're starting to see some of the other variations, like are there lines separating the two columns or not, okay? So we thought about this and we work, in our work with Santa Cruz County, we said, do you wanna try for the two column treatment? Let's get some fast opinions. And so we went to the front of the county building, sat in the hallway there, gave out cliff bars for anybody who would stop for five minutes. And, uh, and we said the instruction we said to them is, we've changed the ballot instructions. We want you to vote to help us make sure that the instructions are very clear now. And we're giving you this uh, wrong color of pen to prove that it's not, it's a test and not fraud. So people did actually say, how do I know you're not gonna keep this ballot? It looks so real. Well, we put we printed it on regular paper and not cardstock, that's one thing. But we also asked people to vote in green or red, which are not valid uh, colors. And the answer was 30% or more of eligible voters who wandered into that study uh, overvoted. That's a huge number. And well-prepared voters were looking for a particular candidate's name. So that's a difference in the attack of if you're already a voter and familiar with things versus somebody who's a relatively new voter. And we got people in that testing because people were coming in to pay their taxes or ask about uh, permits for building and so on. 
And then they stopped and talked to us about voting. And so we got people who were new voters, not yet voters, as well as existing voters, sometime voters, regular voters, a whole bunch of folks. And we it, and this is an argument in favor of usability testing, even when you think you don't have enough time. But it's sometime in that eight day period between certification and uh, having to send it off to the printer, you know, in, get it printed, we were able to spend half a day, three quarters of a day, and made some decisions in conjunction with the folks in uh, Santa Cruz County. And at the same time as we were doing this, LA County did some impromptu testing with their new unique system, because that was the first time they were using this multi-card system. And they had similarly dismal results, way too many overvotes. So let's see what other kinds of variation and layout people offered us. Uh, do we make the columns more or less equal so that they show that they're a single contest? Or do we just use on the, rely on these other mechanisms to show it's a single contest? So we're looking at Ventura County on the left, where they have spread the title of this US Senate contest across two columns. The, the right more two columns and left president on the left side. And then, uh, but they, they, so that was, and they left the columns as close to even as possible with an odd number because it's 34 candidates and one write in. Versus uh, Mariposa County, where they had the president in the first column of three columns and then spread the uh, Senate candidates all the way down the middle column and the overflow into the third column. All of these creative solutions come to you from our election officials. Um, how well did they separate it from other contests? So in many cases, the presidential election appeared in the same context on the same uh, surface, the same face, okay? And now we can see how is the Senate contest separated from other things? And in Nevada County, uh, they had the two columns, but they did not wrap the title of that across the two columns that they're using in the middle and the right-hand side, okay? <clears throat> so some of the things we were, when, you're, when you don't have a single column and you choose to do two or more columns, the question is, make the instructions span all the title and the contest title span all the columns? Do you add a separate heading for each column? Do you add some, do you use arrows? We're gonna see a whole bunch of variation here. Do you remove any lines between the two columns to show the unification of that? How can we do this? So in this first example, the title of the race is indicated by three levels of shading voter nominated offices, which is an opaque term to voters, uh, United States senators, and then candidates listed in two columns, vote for one, okay? And it shows at the bottom, there's this label, candidates continue in the next column. And at the top, it says continued from previous column, from the previous column. So we hope that people understand, this was San Bernardino County, that these were all a unified contest. Um, and here's some more examples of continue, how they showed the continuing. This is Tulare con uh, County. Here's another example where the instructions for everything spans all the columns. This is a non, no party preference ballot from Kern County. And there's three columns for the instructions, two columns for the state senator to show this. And this similar treatment was used in 16 counties. So it's Kern not is just an example here. It's not the only one. Now, there were various mechanisms to unifying the three columns, including uh, no columnar lines and the contest uh, wrapping across the whole page. And so we see here uh, Mendocino County's method and the differences there are one is for a party ballot with the candidates for the party at the top and the others for the nonpartisan ballot. Got it? And again, now we've got the, another mechanism. So we have more candidates shown with arrows at the bottom of the first column and the top of the second column. 
And two counties did this. We're showing you Yuba. Here's another one, San Diego County, which I mentioned earlier. So they actually had three columns on two faces. And the vote for one message was uh, often amplified by getting uh, mentioned more than once. And the question I had was, was one of these patterns gonna work better than another? So in this case at the top, uh, we've got Butte County where they've got the vote for one aligned with the US Senate and over the spot where you're gonna make your mark on the left-hand side of the names. And in San Mateo County on the lower part, again, vote for one aligned, uh, right, left aligned as the marking spot is aligned. Here we go with a center aligned for Mendocino County, where it says three levels of headings, US Senator, US Senate, and vote for one. Whereas in the, uh, Middle spot, you have Calaveras County with a similar treatment, two levels of shading, and Tuolumne County at the bottom. So the vote for one in those cases is center aligned and not over where the mark is going to be made. And then we've got the folks who have vote for one right aligned, and sometimes that goes with a right hand marking where you connect the two parts of the arrow. But sometimes it goes with the left-hand mark, as in this lower one, Glen County. So Shasta on the top, Glen County on the bottom. 22 counties had the right alignment of vote for one. So what I'm telling you here is, in great detail, uh, how many variations there were for each one of these different features. And the question is, did any of these make any difference? So Alameda County here treated it differently in some one case versus another. Uh, so all 58 ballots are different from one another and you can look at the evidence yourself and we received either uh, PDFs or a scan, we scanned the example of each county's ballot and these are in an Ever Evernote notebook which is open to the public. So we're happy for other people to see if they can figure out differences. And so now I know you're all biting your fingernails, waiting to know the results, unless you read some versions of the abstract that I put out. And that is, keep in mind, overvoting ordinarily occurs less than 0.5% of the time. And here's one of the sets of instructions that uh, might have been given. So they include in vote and we only voted for one, John Smith of Party Two, uh, Party C. But the, the the wrong case, which is marked in several ways with red X and a strike through circle, uh, has too many ovals filled in. And so that's the kind of instruction we hope is going to help people, but it can't occur on the ballot. It has to occur somewhere else. In this case, Overvoting rates were as high as 3.6%. At least 235,000 votes were disqualified for this Senate race because of overvoting. And what you can see here is the difference in two columns, two pages, one column, and so on. So there, were, this was a little coding on how the ballots were. And so since so many of them we got this overvoting rate in lots of places. So, so you're saying two columns was worse. We, we, do we get to two, two or more columns is definitely worse. Yes. <clears throat> now, yeah. does the, so the question we asked earlier was, does design of the ballot prevent overvoting errors? And the answer is some, somewhat, yes. The design of the wording prevents some errors. The choice of one column over more than one column will help and the choice of a single face over a second card or face also helps. And no, even careful ballot design choices don't eliminate all the errors in voting and a very large candidate pool presents a challenge both for voters as well as for election officials. Voter education also helps to prevent errors as we saw in that earlier example with the illustrations. So how do we prevent overvoting? Uh, now, wait a second. Let me also say 
there was a one. So the way in which we know this is because some political scientists who are colleagues of ours went through, looked at the results in the months following the election and just said, none of these other factors had anything to do with the overvoting that we could detect. It's all about the confusion of a multi-columnar and too many candidates. Okay, there is another piece of this that can help, and that is, uh, whoop, sorry. So, overvote rate in the Senate primary, stop using the mouse, uh, is 4.1% of the ballots cast in counties using a central tabulation system versus lower overvoting in places that had tabulation at the polling place. So if you're scanning the thing at the polling place, it can spit it out for you and say, there's an overvote and it can get corrected before the actual ballot is submitted finally. Whereas if we're sending all the ballots to headquarters and that's where they're gonna tabulate everything and not scan ahead, that's when we get in trouble and we get this much higher voting, uh, overvoting rate. What do we mean by updating, uh, what do we mean by voter education? Well, if there's time, we urge the county officials to uh, provide the information in the voter guide. And here are three different solutions for how to emphasize that message of vote for one. And three different counties figured out a different, each their own way to fit it into the go to voter pamphlet. Everybody knows that you get two pamphlets from the state of California, one from the uh, Secretary of State's office and then your local county office uh, of elections. And so it's the county office of elections that we were paying attention to here. Hmm. Although I suppose if the uh, Secretary of State had wanted to, they could have emphasized it too. Um, so it, you can read through the example, but there's several different ways that people found uh, to emphasize that this Senate race was important and you should only vote for one candidate. Well, what, what else besides ballot design, what else helps? And I will say policy regulation and law are all change worthy. And one of the great things about uh, working with election officials across the state and through the Center for Civic Design with election officials across the country is that these people often recognize where there are gaps or conflicts and paradoxes between the law and the regulation or the law and the practicality of things and the law and the dates for the election. And they can propose changes in laws or regs. But I also want to say that overvoting is not. And here's another one, another example under this issue. So Broward County, Florida in I'm getting a message that, okay, Broward County, Florida in 2018 created a ballot that effectively hid the U.S. Senate race at the bottom of those instructions. And people overlooked that, those two little spots at the bottom, the Senate and the representative to Congress. And so, uh, other counties did not have this particular layout, but many other counties did not have the issue of three languages also. And so the, the fact that those uh, instructions appear there in three different languages takes up a lot of space. We know people rarely read the instructions. And so people were guided to skip that first column. And in Broward County, 3.7% of people skipped that contest compared to 1.2% or less in other counties. So overvoting, undervoting, those are two big issues that we can talk about. Here's some references and that I'll make sure that that is available to everybody. And I'm ready to have an open discussion with the whole gaggle of you. This is my team at the polling place in Livermore at Celebration Church last November. And all these people are citizens like yourself who came to help with the, over, the, the uh, conducting of the election. We have one student also who did this as kind of extra credit for his government class, I think. Well, well thank you, Nancy. I, I want Stop to- sharing. Uh, yeah. I want, I want to um, start by um, you, you presented, you know, centered, right, left, you know, column. And, and the data um, I, was, I was really excited about is if, if we could 
actually go back and recall which of those mattered. The 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 layout of these uh, of these titles that you spent a lot of time going through. <clears throat> uh, let me go back and share again. Because it's, I mean, it's you know that you really looked at a lot of different things, and they seem subtle, but I I actually believe you that that uh the work was worth worth uh doing and, and those different alternatives were worth well doing. i just i felt like here's this natural experiment here i'm just going to come with this general look um i felt like here's this natural experiment here are people who are very experienced in running elections are not professional designers know what the constraints are because they're living with them all the time and time is one of the biggest ones but um you know, have only a few things that they can play with. And the answer is, Ted, telling people vote for one is really not enough, right? Yeah, I got I got that. Right. So, but, um, you know, did you, you, you pointed out several of these design differences. Are, mm -hmm. uh, now, the one that we know that I noticed quickly in your pie chart was two columns are bad. Uh, multiple columns are bad. Right. Um, can can um, can you make any comments on the other ones that the title across all of them or the or the the left it, right center things? There weren't enough data to make a difference, and none of it was going to overcome overcome the, the this bigger. problem of uh, too many too many names on one contest. Yeah. So I I'm just going to leave it with one story about uh, L.A. County came to me when there were 139. Uh, people on the ballot for the for the uh, Gray Davis uh, recall, and I was asked, and they did not take my suggestion, and we didn't go further. But it was just, it's just a funny story. Um, <clears throat> how can we make it so that there's no precedence? That means none of the none of the people that you're voting for, you're more likely to vote for than any of the others, because <clears throat> actually, in many jurisdictions, uh, they are required to put the incumbent first. For example. Um, in 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 the um, in the lineup of the of the of the uh, candidates, but but I was asked the opposite. How do we make it uh, so that nobody has presses, not the incumbent, for example? And my idea, uh, and then I'll say one more thing about that ballot, and that that's all. Um, my idea was to make it a roulette, roulette wheel, so that you could spin this wheel around, and anybody could be, um, you know. Shows as the, as the, as the, as the same position, so it was all it was all in a circle, which is kind of a silly uh, glib uh, response. Um, in fact, and, the, and then how do you get that to print and tally? Uh, we we had not gotten that far, <laughs> okay. um, but but that that you know it it's something that um, yeah it's a complicated because that particular thing in in L.A. County the problems that Nancy's pointing out so so correctly were those candidates went over eight um, uh, faces. Uh, faces. Yeah. So you had to go through eight faces to find them all. And what we found was that if you were one of the four top candidates, that was Bustamante, Gray Davis, Schwarzenegger, and I can't remember what the fourth one was, everybody next to you uh, on, the, on, the, on the card had a half a percent more chance of getting a selection than if they were anywhere else on the ballot, which meant that people, <clears throat> and this was a paper that a woman named Sarah Hill wrote, people uh, vote more for selections next to people that they recognize accidentally because they make the mistake of slipping and pointing at the thing next to the one that they meant to vote for. So that's just a Right, right. And I mean, there's lots of other uh, statistics that the first person, you know, the, in the order is going to get more votes than yeah, others. Two percent more. At, at least. Right. Yeah. And uh, and as we know, you know, then you got that slip thing. That's an interesting one. Yeah, it's um, called, um, what do the they call it? Um, there's a name for it. Um, when, I'm, when, not, okay. I'm sure I'm, I'm sure there is. And it's not coming to me either at the moment. Um, but you also get that phenomenon of if you're looking for a specific name, right, then those those who are close to that name are, you know, are likely also to, to get the miss the missed vote, the wrong vote. Right. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm moving my mouse. Okay. That's a big so mistake. we should let um, other people uh, ask questions besides me. I'm sorry. Or, or make, make, tell that I see some people's experiences here showing up. I'm looking. I'm looking at the comments. So, 
so Jeff asked about, can the poll workers draw people's attention to this concern? And Marissa actually it. talks, speaks to that a little bit too. And so Jeff, uh, here's the interesting thing about that. Of course, we can do that as poll workers. Uh, the tricky part is, do you know how many people actually come in to vote these days? It's less than 10% of the total votes cast. So it probably won't have an effect on the percent. I mean, it may have an effect on the 10% of people who come in, but it's not going to have the desired effect on the 90% who are voting by mail. In California. In California. Well, and it won't have any effect on anybody in Oregon who's voting by no, mail, no, in Colorado who's voting right. by mail. You know, 17, that, 17 states do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Nancy? Yes, um, please. So the, um, uh, the, the problem of people intending to vote for candidate A and accidentally uh, voting for the one right next to them seems to be aggravated by uh, the distance, at least in the cases where there's name party affiliation and then flush left and then over flush right uh, are two halves of an arrow and you fill in the, the arrow of uh, the center. And that is quite a distance away from the names. Um, is that location required to be over there in the far left? Is there any reason why those yes, columns that's couldn't be it, reversed? No, they can't because that's the way that voting system is set to work. So and, that's called the Sequoia I, system. Uh, and the Sequoia system has these this this join thing and it's in a specific place. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, second question related to that is uh, you've got candidate A, party preference, uh, Democrat, and then uh, th their occupation. Uh, is there any reason why those all have to be flush left? Because if if the names of the candidates were all flush left and then that secondary information like their party affiliation and their career, if that was indented slightly, it would make it a lot easier to scan the column to pick out the names. Yes, I'm not sure, but I suspect that is in uh, codified in the election code. That's really dumb. Yes, there's a lot of dumb things about that. And one of the yeah. things that I thought I had included here, but maybe it's coming up later, is, uh, no, that's not the one, huh. Anyway, oh, here, did we talk about this one? Yeah, we did. You have a blank right here. I don't know what you're looking at. I'm looking at the overvoting. I know, we see a blank screen. I'm still sharing, so let's see. Uh, hold on one second, let me see if you I might can. Wanna share a different screen maybe. Ah, hold on. We are loading. Okay, that was the other one. Now there was something else. That looks better. Yeah, you can see that one now. But I can't. Let me see if I can see the chat at the same time. There. No, I can't see the chat while I'm doing this. Okay. So yeah, there's way too much stuff in there. Oh, I know what. Uh, th sorry, there is a. Okay, this is the other thing I might, let me stop sharing this and share something else. Uh, here, share this. Let's do sharing and where is it? This one, okay. This is the Center for Civic Design. And now I wanted to find out, uh, there are several things that I've been looking at there. This one is the one I wanted to show you. So uh, Whitney, make, Whitney Quisenberry is the, uh, one of the co-founders and the current executive director of the Center for Civic Design. And she wrote this thing about don't legislate ballot design. There's a better way to improve the ballots. And she's talking about, you know, don't codify the, these things. He, she's got another example besides the one that I had, but it, you know, this law doesn't support good design because the equipment is going to change. The way in which people are receiving the news is going to change. We now have electronic marking devices in all of our polling places in California. And so that means it doesn't, you know, 
what size the font is is going to change depending on how you set the magnification and so on. Um, and so what Whitney's uh, urging is don't don't write such specific things, but rather make ballot standards and turn it into regulation rather than legislation so it can adjust when the equipment changes, when the new technologies come out and so on. You won't have to rewrite all the election code. Um, and so uh, Virginia, for example, adopted new ballot standards with the help from the Center for Civic Design. And so that's uh, a model for, and as we all know, as UX designers, you know, a good design system can go a long way and it doesn't have to be as specific as this size font, this type of font, all caps, whatever, because we know all caps is harder to read for lots of people. Anyway, I'm going to stop sharing. That's the article I wanted to draw your attention to. And I did that. Let me go back and see what else you guys were talking about in the chat when I wasn't paying attention. Well, I just want to say something about font design that you just brought up. So our, our friend Aaron Marcus kind of started his career by pointing out that, you know, layout and font design uh, are, you know, really change the way people can uh, recognize and and uh, read, you know, uh, interfaces, but also, um, of course, we know it's true for, for things like this, where this is an interface that is quasi-computer interface. Well, it, I mean, in many cases, it's not a computer at all. You get a paper ballot, you sign a paper, you know, you fill out your paper ballot and you send in your paper ballot. The, if you want more on fonts, Ted, I think, and everybody else too, you may be interested in Gareth Williams, uh, a Brit, do you know him? And so he's been doing a lot of stuff related, as a dyslexic himself, he's been doing a lot of work on which fonts actually are more readable versus uh, reputed to be more readable uh, in different contexts and so on. So he's got a pretty complicated study that he's been conducting and people may be interested in reading that and critiquing that. I think, yeah. So John, you have been an election official in what county in the state of California? You can unmute if you like. John Boykin. Yes, oh, I, I, had, yes. I had to un, unmute and all that. Uh, yeah. Yes, I was an election official. It was 40 years ago uh, in Fresno County within California. And so I, I would like to get involved. I would like to talk with you sometime later because I'd like to get involved with, um, with this organization and help out. Uh, so yeah, I care a lot about um, uh, ballot design and uh, the way elections are conducted and it desperately needs more design input. <laughs> Absolutely. So just let me see this one. Okay, and then the, the one of the topics, and I, I wanted to call attention because I know that Maricela, you've also been an, a, a poll worker. And I know that Sam, you've been a poll worker. And anybody else who's on the call that I didn't know about? I've just been a election researcher. Right, right. And one thing I'll, I'll mention that most people don't realize about elections is that uh, you only have a significant election every two years. You only have a major election every four years. That means you get very little opportunity to practice. And uh, the people who were involved in the last election may be long gone by the time the next one comes. So there, there tends to be a shortage of A, institutional memory, and, and B, uh, ways of learning from the mistakes of last time to correct them next time. And, and so the idea that, oh, yes. the, you know, the, the poll workers should do X, Y, Z. Okay, well, the poll workers are volunteers uh, who uh, you're lucky if they were around last time. Um, and they're not going, and, and they got maybe an hour or two of training, unless they've done this over and over again over the years. But things but, change, you know. Things uh, change. Between mm -hmm. last year and this year, even between mm -hmm. the primary and the general election this year, mm -hmm. things change. And, you know, I because I was going to be the captain of the same vote center and I had requested getting most of the same people back. You know, I said, if they're available, I'm happy to take them. We're running as a tight ship. We really know how to work with each other. 
And so that was good. But there were certain use cases where I said specifically to the trainers, what do I do in this situation? For example, uh, somebody comes in, has it with their original ballot, but they haven't marked it yet and they haven't sealed it yet. And they say, I want to turn this in and get a fresh ballot. And then I say to them, that's fine. You can do that. We're just going to give you something that looks exactly the same as what you've got. If you want to, you know, vote it here, you can, and then we'll put it in the trolleys and the secret, you know, but it turns out you can't put it in the regular trolley for the regular container that we put oh, the uh, ballot box in, right? The, ba the ballots in that are cast there. You have to put it then into the vote by mail box. So we're at the polling places. We collected huge numbers of vote by mail ballots this last time. And even in the primary, because there was so much talk about uh, the US postal system not being uh, secure. Full in, with, secure or with acting with full integrity or whatever it was. So we got a mess of vote by mail ballots at the polling place, which was fine. We're happy to take them. But this little tweak of you come in carrying your original ballot and you want to uh, cast it, we can let you do that, but you're going to cast it as though it were a vote by mail ballot. Sure. It'll get counted in the vote by mail pile. Ted, you got your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to John's thing there. Um, in Florida, um, basically what happens is if you get to practice before you vote on a new voting system, it makes a gigantic difference. And in Florida, for example, they, uh, by giving people the experience and making people uh, they went around with, a, with, with an RV and showed people how to use the voting uh, stuff. Um, they reduced um, overvotes from 1.9% uh, down to 0.4%. Uh, All right. In so it is, it is not a small problem you just brought up. It is, it is a, it's a wonderful thing that can be solved with, more, with, with just getting people the experience and exposure and practice. And right. Brazil, for example, does a very nice job of making these voting machines available way in advance, three months in advance, and uh, having people in malls and shopping centers and things try them out. And it's just a great idea viewers, to get to get people experience because it's done so rarely, among other things. And I, I want to surface Jeff's, I'm changing the topic slightly. Thank you, Ted. Um, and I want to surface Jeff's comment about ranked choice voting. I still think ranked choice voting is very hard for people to understand. Except Including in Ireland, election officials. Except in Ireland where they've been doing it forever and it's a national sport. So, <laughs> you know, if if it's if it's if it's a game you're used to, I mean it's back to what we were just talking about. If you're used to it and understand it, then it's what you do. And if it's brand new, then you don't know how to interpret it. And I think it's that I, that's my belief about it because of right. um, how it works in Ireland always does it. That they love doing this, and they a, literally they 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 take two weeks to go through the ranked choice, and then they the reporting all the newspapers and on the televisions, and everyone's betting on it. It's crazy. And Lisa confirms that even for a well-educated person, it's hard to get the thing right. I Jeff, do you have any? Completely yeah, Lisa or Jeff, completely messed it up. Yep. And, and Jeff, you want to tell more about that? Um, well, no, it's well, just, uh, you know, I was helping the San Francisco uh, voting office um, with some of their voting issues for, for a while. This was, this was uh, maybe 10 years ago. And, um, you know, they were introducing ranked choice voting and they just had a problem with people either just voting once, voting for one candidate and not not voting for anyone else, or people voting for three times for the same person because they didn't want to mm -hmm. you know, put anyone else's name forward. Um, and mm -hmm. that I don't know if that counts as an overvote or whether the machine just sort of takes your first choice and doesn't give you any other choices. If you if you just say you you say let's say john smith mary jones and and uh fred fred uh you know chu are our vote are are the three candidates and you you know you're supposed to rank them one two and three and some people just say 
you know, John Smith, John Smith, John Smith. Does that count as an overvote? Uh, that, that's a policy question. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how that works because uh, I haven't worked on a bank ranked choice voting problem yet. Yeah. It's San Francisco, Oakland has it, and there's lots of other jurisdictions where that are adopting ranked choice voting. And the reason is it saves you a mess of money. You never have to have a runoff. And uh, you don't have to deliver all that equipment to a specific location multiple times for a single election yeah. and train all these people to show up too. Saves you so, also yeah. many also, minutes of money when, you, when, uh, when things work correctly and you don't have the problem that we just had in Oakland. Right, <laughs> um, right. But, but there also is an organization that pushes for it that says that it gives a better outcome. And there's a literature that one can look at, and and it's, there's a lot of discussion about it. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Um, I wanted to comment as someone that that has done been a poll worker, um, and you know I've worked in libraries, so my focus is mostly on like well, not mostly, but a lot of it is on service design. Um, that the poll workers often are trained like it can be two, three months in advance and forget, you know, the training that they had that lasted a few hours. Um, a lot of the times um, them practicing on the machines is an option, it's not required. So then they get to the election polls the day of and they don't know how to use the thing or they practice again months in advance and they've forgotten how to do what they practiced um, so long ago. Um, you are supposed to arrive, I think it's like one to two hours early. And like, you're literally, you just meet the people you're going to work with all day. Like, um, when you don't know these strangers, um, sometimes I think all of the times I've done it, the person in charge has been late, um, or people have been missing, uh, people arrive, you know, uh, or you don't have enough people. And so you can't have breaks or you have to you know, they have to bring someone in, they have to bring in an extra person. Um, it's been very chaotic. Um, and uh, often the per person in charge, I feel like they just wanted to supervise and they didn't want to, like, when they wanted more pay, so they did the, the like, kind of manager role. Um, but they have to fill in for people so that people can take breaks. Um, and they, you know, were not prepared and I kind of took charge and had to like, be like, okay, this person needs to take a break and we need to rotate or they didn't memorize the manual like I did. And like, I had to be like, no, actually on page such and such, the law says this, this is what we're supposed to be doing. We're not supposed to put the ballot in this thing. We're supposed to put it in that thing. Um, and then it's typically the people that are poll workers are people that aren't working. So they're like retirees, you know, or students or people that are unemployed. Um, sometimes I have been unemployed and it's like, yeah, I'm not used to really working with people like that, um, working in a team. Or um, another part of that is, um, ah, I forgot what I was talking about. Um, it's a good list. Oh, I, I, I have taken off work, time for work to be a poll worker, and that is uncommon. People do not do that. Um, so it's kind of like being on a jury, I feel. Like you don't get your peers. Um, and so, <laughs> right? And right? That's how I feel. Um, and I feel like I, most, yeah. most worker don't, most people don't know that poll workers get paid. I feel they think they volunteer because it's like elderly people, you know? They think it's just retirees well, doing that. And here's the interesting thing also about the, about the where the where it's happening now, the state of California a couple of years ago, three to be exact, implemented the Voters Choice Act, which means that we're sending out all the ballots as vote by mail, and you are allowed to come in and vote. But we're not doing precinct level voting in most counties anymore. We're doing vote center voting, so that means within a county, you can go to any one of the vote centers and be issued a, a replacement ballot for exactly your precinct. That is your water department, your um, housing commission, and as well as your assembly person and so on and so forth. So that part is great. Pre the ballot on demand part is great. However, I wanna underscore something John Boykin said before, and that is when you come to vote, and the same is when you come to be an election worker for the voting, you, have, you do it infrequently, 
and yet we expect everybody to do it perfectly, right? You've got to cast your vote just right. And, uh, and we as election workers have to treat it just right, even when you are one of these one-off cases that we hadn't really trained for. So um, Yeah, and I, I would just add that uh, designing for, a, um, for an election, both the, the design of the ballot and the, the process kind of design, uh, is actually uh, very comparable to designing a website in a couple of important ways. Number one, you're dealing with the public, um, uh, which is always a random chaotic thing. Uh, number two, um, the, the less you have to rely on instructions and prior education, the better, uh, because number one, most people won't pay any attention to it. Number two, the few who do will forget it by the time uh, the moment comes. It has to be... Um, as self-explanatory in the moment as you can possibly make it without relying on any prior knowledge, even from 17 seconds ago. Good, thanks. Lisa has a hand wave. A hand I was wave. just gonna say, but you're dealing with the law. <laughs> it's so <laughs> yeah. counterintuitive. Yeah. Lisa. Uh, I, I, I had a question uh, for you, Nancy, and of course, any all you other experienced poll, poll people. Um, so uh, uh, the practice, you know, whatever they call that um, newsprint, you know, ballot that you get. Sample ballot. Um, okay. Yep. So what I don't understand and, and I causes me a problem, and I'm sure I'm not alone, is okay. um, I always assume and I know it's, you know, wrong, but I assume that what I see in that booklet, I will find the equivalent of on those cards, you know, so that I ideally yeah. can just transfer, you know, work it all out and figure it all out and then go and transfer it onto the card. And the thing that, you know, frustrates and causes me an error is that I find there are people missing. There's not that prop, you know, well, where was that proposition? It wasn't that, that, that kind of thing. What is the mm. deal with that? That shouldn't be, but it is the possibility. Now, one of these things may be that uh, the sample ballot may not include all the propositions because the propositions are coming from the state and all the rest of the offices are, and things are being handled by the county. So, uh, except the certification is coming from the state of who's a candidate and who's not. So I'm not sure why your sample ballot doesn't look like your regular ballot. Because um, I think that might help should. them. If, if, if yeah, it, yeah. You no. Know. Well, and the intention it, it also... is you get a... Go ahead, it's, it's also possible that maybe um, you're looking at a sample ballot for one person and going to the polling place for another person, because at least when I did it way back when, um, within a given county, there might be uh, multiple sequences. So um, over, so uh, in one area, the candidates are listed A, B, C, in the next group, they're listed B, C, A, and in the next they're listed C, B, A, and, uh, and C, A, B, every imaginable combination um, and so uh, if you are not looking at the sample ballot for your particular, it's called a style, um, uh, your yeah. particular unique combination of offices to vote on, uh, which varies from area to area, the sequence in which they're listed, which varies from one area to another, then yeah, then they would look different. Yeah, but I, well, and I'm not sure about that, Lisa. I mean, it, it, my understanding was, at least in the state of California, is that you're supposed to get the sample ballot that looks just like your regular ballot. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And uh, why you don't, I don't know. Never has happened. I mean, I'm thinking, I'm trying to think of an election that I voted in where I actually found that that was the case. Nope. Okay, we'll have to look into that. Open question. Ted, you're next. Yeah, um, that that uh, the correspondence of a sample ballot to the normal ballot in many many jurisdictions is carefully uh, established. Um, there are problems, for example, there are places where they add the the final ballot will be defined in the last forty eight hours before the election, and when that happens, 
somebody drops out, something changes, of course, you've got a problem if you have some things that are printed. The other problem that happens in California um, is that um, we have these two booklets, you know, the state and the, and the federal. And, and it, uh, no, it's the state and the county. State and the county. Okay, forgive me. And, and I think that, that that's also a problem. I mean, but I've seen in many, many jurisdictions, in fact, it turns out that you can save a lot of vote mistakes by filling out a sample ballot beforehand. Whatever you use to fill it out and make a list and, and check it against can reduce your errors um, by, by a, like a third. So that's, that's a big deal. I wanted to just speak for a moment about Marissa's um, thought, which is, I just want to uh, give an example. In, in LA County, they had two hours of, of voting, of, of ballot training back when I was evaluating this. And they had these folders that had these pink, green, blue tabs for the different things you had to look up as a poll worker. And in Chicago, they had two days of training and they had a book, a thick ass book. And what I found was the problems Marissa's describing reminded me of what I saw in Chicago, which is people were overwhelmed with the information and it was done too much in advance and it was done in a class, there you go, a classroom setting. And then um, yeah. people made lots of mistakes. Whereas the shorter, the shorter uh, uh, introduction with good materials, well-designed materials with these tabs on them and different colored paper, people were doing a much better job at finding the problem and the solution. And then one other problem that was the solution is that back in 2000, the famous election that screwed up, uh, there was, maybe it was even more early, recent than that, the, the election officials would call in to the election uh, center in LA and they'd have a 40 minute wait. So if they have a problem, they were not being able to get through. So now that we're using the internet, poll books and better, better communication things, when a poll worker has a problem, you want them to be able to get an answer from somebody official. So that those are, I don't know if those so, are relevant. And so uh, I can speak to some of those supports for poll workers in California, or at least Alameda County these days. Um, we had really good support, I felt like. We had uh, a young man who only had four or five vote centers that he was responsible for. And so he could go around and visit with each of us twice a day, at least. And he happened to be present at a time when one of our printers failed. And of course, we were doing all this printing of ballots on demand. And we, he said, let me see if I have another uh, ink cartridge for that one in my car. And he actually did. So that like saved us hours and so on. But if he hadn't, we had a backup printer that we could use. Oh, one more thing about John's. Good. We also had a, a special. Good. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So anyway, we had a, a, a special phone and we actually had two phones that we could call to downtown with. I called it downtown, you know, to the ROV headquarters. And so if we had any problems of equipment or somebody had a problem of some other sort or somebody got sick and they had to leave and I, I might want a replacement worker to come in. We had the direct line to the, you know, we had the hotline to support. So Alameda County at least has taken those few measures that really help to Super. support the poll workers on site. The crazy part was, of course, now here's one of the other things and I think some of us have spoken to this already. Um, <laughs> voters don't understand the relationship between the registrar voters office and the specific site that they're using as a voting site for this time. And because we were at the church, people said things <clears throat> to us like how good it is for you to volunteer. No, we're getting paid, but we're not getting paid very much. Uh, and, <clears throat> and the fact that we're at the church blesses the whole election. <laughs> okay thank you so much but that has nothing to do with it um and and you know there's much confusion about the relationship uh, between we weren't in the in the sanctuary we were in the social hall or the multi-purpose room or whatever they call it and the security in there was only partial because we would lock the front door of that room but we knew that the several teachers for the preschool and so on had the 
keys to the back of the room and the kitchen was on the other side. So at any time, people from the church might be going into the rooms that were adjacent to the place that we were using as a polling place. And it's kind of crazy, you know, I didn't, I, how little I know about physical security. And yet uh, I could tell this was not a well-secured site. However, every night we find, this is good. They've changed the instructions. Every night we put away everything and locked it up that had anything to do with changing votes. We left the pens out, but put away all the electronic equipment that was keeping the poll records up to date, who's voted and who hasn't. And then of course, you know, as, uh, so many uh, so many people have special cases. You get people who walk in and say, I'm from Merced County, but I want to vote today. And then I it's say, well, this is, I, you know, you, you, you can do a provisional vote, but it's not going to get to the place that you need it to get to in time, right? So all they get, it, it, anyway, it's it's too hard to vote across counties. Yeah, um, a provisional vote is something that came up in 2002, where the, if you go into a polling place and you say, I should vote here, and that you're not on the registration list, right? You are allowed to vote yes. for federal uh, federal offices. So you you can mark anything you want to, but the only the federal ones will count. But the question is, if you don't have an address in this county that we can tie you to, you're not going to get counted. You can say, "I want this to go to San Joaquin County," or "I'm really visiting from LA County, and I I really care about the president and the Senate election, which." our standard across the state. There's no way we can physically deliver the ballot you cast to LA County in time for them to count it and it to be received by the deadline. But the, right? but, but the reason for provisional ballots was there was a lot of people that thought they were registered and were be denied votes. And that's no, right. And it, so we it do solved, it solves a lot of problems. Yes. And now we have these two categories and thank God they're kind of starting to fold them in together. There's a conditional vote and a provisional vote. That's Don't good. ask me to separate them. I have I have to go and look at my book to tell you how they're different. Uh, so know and it, you know, and now the other thing is also that they have enabled us, the poll workers, to change your physical address as long as you're still inside the county, uh, but we can change your record right there. And then you still fill out the, uh, effectively a new registration form. I wanna make a comment about Nancy's description of the vote, the polling place. So polling places, you know, they're supposed to be accessible. That means you'd be able to wheel there in a wheelchair and something like 70% um, have gotten to. Uh, and the, the, the thing that's really important is that polling places should be checked out and designed and tested before the day of election. And that's one of the good things about using the same place over and over again. So you understand and have institutional memory as we we're talking about, about the things that Nancy just described. Um, when that doesn't happen, you have people go out with Sharpies and, and make signs. And the trouble with Sharpies and making signs ad hoc, and you heard a bunch of stories about Nancy trying to solve problems, figuring out how to make things work in spite, of, in spite of the fact that it hadn't been thought of ahead of time, is that this is more common than it should be. And it causes problems. I have a nice photograph of four polling places in one, one place where there was a narrow door going in and the, 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 the line was 40 minutes, but only one polling place was, was not was was full so that all the other polling places depending on which polling place you went to it would it would it could have happened instantly and um so you know bad bad polling place design is a really lingering and dangerous problem and it's it's it causes um loss of uh on the order of one percent of votes lisa countrywide yeah. uh yeah i wanted to ask you um this last election, I was just out of surgery. I was recovering from a surgery and I was offered an aide, somebody uh, from the Alameda County where I am, uh, who would supposedly would come to my house and help me to vote. I didn't actually use that, but can you tell me what that involves? How does that work? I don't know about the going to your house. I know about the uh drive up voting. 
So if you were able to get somebody to drive you to the polling place and then send them in to tell us that you were there, we would send out a worker uh, with a ballot, if you didn't have your ballot, with a ballot uh, and observe you vote and then take it back sealed, you know, into the polling place. So we could have a designated assistant, you know, one of our poll workers, one of the clerks, they have three designations, captain, judge, and clerk here. Different places, they call them different things. But anyway, uh, we would be able to help you with uh, drive up voting. That, that, um, uh, they, best practices would be to have two people there so yeah, everybody's yeah, observing, yeah. so that nobody well, can do some shenanigan with you. Yeah, right. they actually offered that one to me, but they, they said, the full service, they told me, full service is still, they'll come to my house because I could not get into a vehicle at that point. Right. That they would come to my house and sit there with me and help me vote. That sounds they, good. They called that full service. I love it. They don't tell yeah. us about that because we're not going to go out and do that, right? We're there to staff the polling place. Yeah. I just had never heard of that. Had no idea. <laughs> no, I, it's a great service. I love it. I don't think that's a universally available thing. No, no and it's also a very risky thing because uh, you need to make sure that these people are legit and not somebody there who's who's there to make sure that you vote the way they want you to vote. Yeah, uh, that's right. well, that's why I was asking about this. Is, right, and that argues that... again for the two people rather than one. Yeah. And they're not. Yeah. I don't think their full service allows for two people to go out, but I could be wrong. John's point is a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I wasn't sure we'd have enough to talk about to fill the hour and a half, but look, it, it's nice. Voting, we can go on all <laughs> night long. Uh, and, and forgive me, I just, I, I, I spent a little bit of time uh, back at the beginning of the, the mess um, starting something called the Voting Technology Project at MIT. And so that's kind of where some of my background comes from. But uh, all this Did on the ground, uh, all the, uh, I'm just sharing your, your, your introduction, I hope. Um, all of that on the ground and working with this um, with the Center uh, for Democ um, for Civic Design um, is is f really really a fascinating story, Nancy, that you've shared with us. And um, I think that this kind of care and and thought and expecting to do experiments all the time on any anything we build is is important. But voting, um, I. Uh, have often said is um, difficult because whatever we do that's important, we have more stress with. And whatever we do rarely, we have less less experience as John was telling us with. And those two things come together to make these errors much more possible, uh, much more, and, and, and the design matters even more in that case. So thank you very much, Nancy, and thank you everybody for coming and uh, with that. Um, Thank I, you everybody for showing up. Uh, yeah, uh, we appreciate you staying around too. And, oh, and um, I was, <laughs> next Tuesday. And yes, any more you wanna say? One, the one thing I was gonna say is you announced the April program with Don Norman, that's great. And I wanted to make sure people also know that in March, we're gonna have Jared Spool. So we got a couple of headliners coming in the spring and lots of future headliners all the rest of the time. Yeah. Can you say a moment? Uh, say something about Jared Spool, just to make people. Uh, Jared Spool is the owner and operator of a company called UIE User Interface Engineering, and now he's more actually switched over to be an educator, and he's running uh, in service and uh, you know professional development work in conjunction with a program called Center Center, which is spelled the two different you know, ways uh, where uh, people can learn about user experience roles and functions and uh, dilemmas and what to do with them uh, in a classroom or virtual classroom setting. Um, so he's been doing this kind of work for as long as you and I had, Ted. Yeah. And what, what's the date in March? Uh, it's the second, 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 second Tuesday. Tuesday. Always the okay. second Tuesday, always 7.30. And uh, uh, Nancy, I, I, would I would definitely love to uh, chat with you um, sure. offline after this, because uh, I'd like to get involved in that. Right. Well, uh, I'm not involved with the Center for Civic Design anymore myself, 
I mean, uh, I'm <clears> friends <throat> with all those people. And you can certainly write to Whitney and say, uh, you heard me talk about this issue. Um, and does she, and they Whitney do collect- Quisenberry. Quisenberry, Q-U-E-S-E-N-B-U-B-E-R-Y, one at the, R. At the Center for C Civic Design? Yes, it's called, it's called civicdesign.org. That's how you find it. Um, but John, there are lots of opportunities also to do things uh, related to civic tech and civic design. And we've had speakers about this topic previously from Bakai. So there's like an innovation office in San Jose where they do stuff. And they may be able to uh, involve volunteers as well as professionals. Okay. Um, there are, there's Code for America, which is constantly needing more UX help. Mm -hmm. and, uh, our, and you may be familiar with our friend, uh, Sid Harrell, C-Y-D-H-A-R-R-E-L-L. -L. And she is very much involved in civic tech and has written a little book and gave us a talk about it at one point. And so she may be another source of good ideas on how you can get involved. But I'm certainly willing to talk to you. Sure. So okay. I, with that, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to have to leave and we're going to have to um, end this program. Um, and I hope everybody uh, makes new friends, uh, such as John and, and Nancy, and that we get together uh, as many or more people each month. And it's great to have you all.